Indeed, it's not our dietary fat that is making us unhealthy. It is our consumption of sugar and other refined carbohydrates that is central in terms of increasing this mechanism called inflammation that underscores all of our chronic degenerative conditions, uh, including Alzheimer's disease. So the degree of validation that Grain Brain has received over the past five years has been really encouraging, uh, very uh, validating for us in terms of the work that we do. Uh, I think that moving forward, uh, what the future holds in terms of that validation, we will see. But I think that there's a wave now of lowering our carbohydrates, welcoming healthful fat back to the table. And with, with the addition of Brain Maker, which looked at our gut bacteria and the role that our gut bacteria are playing in terms of determining our health, uh, moving forward, recognizing the importance of fermented foods and what we call prebiotic fiber to nurture the gut bacteria, to lower inflammation, to set an environment that's good for the brain, good for the immune system. I think uh, there's a, a groundswell of information in this science now uh, that where it goes, who knows, but we see uh, such popularity in both the lay and in the professional press uh, that we're really going to a better place. Now when I talk about eating healthier fat or more healthful fat to be grammatically correct, uh, it, it's interesting to look at some of the studies that are coming out these days that are challenging that. One of them had to do with consumption of eggs or other dietary sources of cholesterol. And this study was really quite interesting because it felt, uh, it concluded rather that uh, all-cause mortality as well as cardiovascular related issues uh, were increased in people who either uh, consumed more eggs or consumed diets that were higher in cholesterol. And I think uh, the conclusions that were reached are interesting and should be looked at. We welcome all science, but I think that when we talk about consuming eggs or high cholesterol foods like meat and other forms of, for example, seafood, we have to recognize that quality is really very important that eggs in general that you might buy at the grocery store may well be of low quality, may be threatening to your health for a number of reasons. There is no alchemy that takes place when we feed chickens garbage and expect them to produce an egg that's going to be good for us. I believe that eating uh, organically raised uh, eggs where the yolk is really orange yellow, you can tell the difference. Uh, I, I can't imagine that that is necessarily going to be threatening to health. I happen to think it's a good food. Uh, I think that sources of cholesterol from good sources that you recognize as being quality, grass-fed beef, for example, if you choose to eat beef, uh, wild seafood as opposed to farm-raised seafood, are very reasonable and uh, for part of your diet. But I would say, to be fair, that we need to follow this literature. We can't just throw out literature because it doesn't suit our perspectives. And I think to be open-minded is, again, demonstrating taking somebody else's point of reference for a moment and seeing what it's like to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. That's a manifestation of using your prefrontal cortex and not acting impulsively. I think it's really good to keep an open mind and see what the future holds in terms of really good research. I do believe that gluten does represent a threat to human health, and I think that is a threat to all humans. It doesn't mean that the world comes crashing to an end if you happen to have a piece of bread. Obviously, that's not reality. But I think the research clearly indicates that gluten does tend to pose a threat to the integrity of the gut lining. And that turns out to be very important. The gut lining is a, a very important regulator of a lot of things in human physiology, including uh, inflammation. And some people respond much more negatively than others. People, for example, with celiac disease, which only represents about 1.4% of our population, have a dramatic autoimmune reaction when they are exposed to gluten-containing foods. But we do know that there are a large number of people who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And that might be 20, 30, 40 percent of the population who may have manifestations, uh, physical manifestations from consuming gluten. And what's really important to understand is that these problems from eating gluten may not necessarily involve the gastrointestinal system. 
What does that mean? It means they may not have gut-related issues when they consume gluten. They may have skin uh, irritation, rashes, joint pain, uh, headaches, even cognitive issues from gluten consumption. So I think people, uh, even without celiac disease, uh, should consider going gluten-free or at least doing their very best to reduce their gluten consumption. And to be clear, what I am not saying is shop the gluten-free aisle in the, in the grocery store. That would be a bad recommendation. Why? Because I think this is something everyone should do. Walk down the gluten-free aisle and what do you see? You see crap. You see gluten-free cupcakes and cake mix and pie crusts and bread and you name it. And, the, and yes, it's gluten-free. Does that mean I can go and eat all I want? No, it doesn't mean that at all. These are high refined carbohydrate foods that absolutely need to be avoided because that plays into inflammation. Again, a very important central theme as it relates to brain degeneration. So I think the gluten-free movement is here to stay, I think with good reason. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm pleased that, you know, years ago, again, our description of why gluten-free was important in grain brain was very disruptive. It's not disruptive anymore because people are really embracing this. In 2018, the ketogenic diet was the number one search term on Google in terms of health, and with good reason. We know that a ketogenic diet is a diet that reduces inflammation. That's our major goal in terms of health. This is a diet that plays a huge role in regulating how effective insulin is in the human body. It's a diet that's proven effective in terms of being healthful for the brain. New research shows that the ketogenic diet is extremely helpful, helpful with respect to Parkinson's disease. Uh, we've known for a long, long time that it can help seizures. Uh, it can be helpful with respect to any number of inflammatory conditions, including joint pain. But I think perhaps most importantly, and the reason it's getting so much traction these days, is it's a really handy way of losing weight. And that's, you know, in a country where 70% of adults are either overweight or obese, that's very important. And it's a diet, ketogenic diet, that is really relatively new. I mean, this is a diet that humans have experienced only for about the past two million years. So this is really a relatively new experience for us. It's only been uh, two million years that we've been able to realize that this is the diet that has kept humans alive and healthy. So it's a diet that's focused on consuming higher levels of good fats and significantly reducing refined carbohydrates and obviously sugar in any of its forms. And I don't mean just white refined sugar. I mean things that people might believe are healthful, uh, like honey, even if it's organic or maple syrup, or these other forms of, of sugar that people think, well, I'm not eating sugar, I'm eating these and these are good for me. No. It's also, I think, a diet that is a bit confusing for people and that people may have issues with on the front end if they're not careful. And I think the two areas that need to be ranked in terms of being important uh, for people wanting to engage this very healthful diet, the ketogenic diet, are number one, when you cut your carbohydrates, make sure you're not throwing out dietary fiber. By definition, dietary fiber is a carbohydrate, but going low carb uh, might cause people to think, therefore, no fiber-rich vegetables. Bad idea. So we've got to focus on net carbs. That's the total carbs, but you subtract out uh, the fiber-rich vegetables that we want to include. The other area that people have issues with on the ketogenic diet seems to be electrolytes, things like potassium and magnesium, when your body is producing these ketone bodies that it produces once it starts to metabolize fat, these ketone bodies tend to uh, accumulate in the blood and ultimately in the urine and draw out the electrolytes so people can have issues. So supplementing with magnesium and potassium is often a way to offset what has become known as the keto flu, which would cause some people to want to abandon going on the ketogenic diet. From my perspective, ketogenic diet has proven its efficacy in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. We know that early on, uh, before people have the clinical manifestations of Alzheimer's, in other words, the cognitive and executive function issues that um, are manifestations of declining brain function, that their brains are actually demonstrating on sophisticated PET scanning 
the inability to use glucose or sugar as a fuel source in specific Alzheimer's related areas. And what is uh, interesting is that even in the Alzheimer's patient, uh, you can override those deficits when you supply ketones. These areas light up again and start working. But I want to make vi one very, very important point. These PET scans that demonstrate these metabolic uh, problems in the brain, inability to utilize glucose, are present 20, 30 years before people begin to have cognitive decline. We institute changes in the brain in terms of its metabolism. We, we pave the way uh, for this to happen when we have higher levels of blood sugar day in and day out. That compromises the function of insulin in the human body and we then become resistant to insulin, what we call insulin resistance. And that is a harbinger for Alzheimer's disease. We become insulin resistant when we eat sugar and we eat refined carbohydrates. So again, this is a message for the 20 year olds and the 30 year olds and the adolescents and the children that the time to fix the roof is when the sh sun is shining and cut the carbs now, net carbs, and eat more healthful fat. If you love that last video, you're gonna love the next one. Check it out here. Stress can definitely affect our stem cells. High stress will blunt the activity of our stem cells. Mm. You know, it's just like stunning them. So they're like, wait a minute, what do I do now? You know, maybe I'm not gonna be so enthusiastic in rebuilding our organs. We gotta rebuild our blood vessels, we gotta 